after you wrote it, you know what you mean, but nobody else does. <laughs> but if you can forget it and then go back and read it again, you read it kind of like somebody else would. So that's what I was planning on doing, but I forgot all about it till last night. So I want to I wanna just talk to you here this morning about seven things to give your children. I may hit the highlights and and then we'll go on with the service. And, uh, but I'm going to start in Proverbs 13 and 22. Proverbs 13 and 22 says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. There is an inheritance that is very valuable that we need to hand down to our children I was always touched by that story about a young man who walked along with his father in profound silence. The boy was leaving home, and if one could read the emotion in the faces, the father's heart was breaking. Suddenly, the father looked at his beloved son and said unto him, I am not a rich man, and it tears me apart to know that you're leaving to find work because I can't give you enough to make a living on the farm. The son interrupts, Dad, it's not your fault. Times are tough for everyone. Anyhow, said the father, I have thought about it a lot. And I wanted to give you something. The man choked on his next words. But I have nothing to give except my name. I've done my best to live an honest life and have a good name in this community. No scandal has ever been attached to my name. Son, that's all I have to give you. Please don't tarnish your family name. You know, I tell you, that fellow right there gave an inheritance to his son that's a whole lot more valuable than some of these very, very wealthy people are given to their children. And I could call names. In all reality, there's been... Wealthy people, famous people that have handed money and fame and fortune to their children but not character and not a good name. So there are some things that are very important to give to our children and one of them is a spiritual heritage. What's going to be passed down in your family? You're going to need to pass down your values at least if you have some values. Now if you don't have any values... I'd like to give them my values. <laughs> but if you have values, I hope you can pass your values down to your children. But if they're not important to you, they will not be important to your family. Prayer has to be a priority in the parent's life for children to want to pray. Parents must be aware that sometimes the flawless training that we would like to do is almost and practically impossible in the first place. But if we did flawlessly train our children, we'd still need a move of the Holy Ghost for them to be born again. The most perfectly trained child still has a fallen nature about them. The most exemplary parents have flaws in them, and no one is going to do the perfect job. Now, I wish we would. We can try. We can strive at that. But when it comes right down to it, unless we have revival in our home, our children will be lost. Even a good man like Samuel, and he's one of the few people in the Bible that you can't find a sin mentioned. Now, there's other prophets and other people that you talk about failures, but his children was lost, and he is a praying, godly, holy man. And so you can't say that he had a character flaw that was so flagrant that it passed on to his children. That's not the way it was. Children have to make their own decisions. And in order for them to make the right ones, we're going to have to be people of prayer. I appreciate good methods, but I believe what E.M. Bounds said about methods. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better or not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men. 
He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. And I'd say that the same thing about parents. And it's wonderful to have a plan. You're foolish if you don't, that you have to realize you need the Spirit of God to move on you, to move on your children. Now, I want to give you a few promises to encourage you to believe God wants to move in your house. In Hebrews 11 and 7, it said, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark for the saving of his house. In Genesis 7 and 1, it says, The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Then in Exodus 12 and 3, about the Passover, speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take unto them every man a lamb, according to the house of his fathers. A lamb for an house. God wants the house saved. God wants all the children saved. In Joshua 24 and 15, Joshua made this declaration, As for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. In Luke 19 and 9, Jesus said unto them about Zacchaeus, This day is salvation. Come to this house. Hallelujah. Zacchaeus just got saved. But it wasn't just about salvation coming to Zacchaeus. It came to his house as well. In Acts 11 and 13 it says, Then he showed us how and it's talking about Cornelius, how that he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. The Lord wants to save all of our family. Acts 16 and 31, it says, when the question was asked, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in all thy house. Now, there's other scriptures that I need to preach from sometime, but I'm trying to get through this because I may, I may need to preach another message here in a little bit. I don't know. But another thing you all need to give your children, every parent needs to give their children is a stable marriage. The one commandment about the family the one commandment about the family that is repeated more than any other commandment is Genesis 2 and 24. That's the first commandment to the home, and it's commanded by Jesus. It's commanded by Paul. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. There is a forsaking of other family ties and a cleaving to the husband and wife. It's very obvious the husband and wife has a till death do us part relationship. Now, the children are wonderful, but, it, but the children cannot dominate your marriage. Your dedication, primarily, husband needs to be to your wife. And your dedication, wife, needs to be primarily to your husband. I'm not saying you don't honor your mother and father still somewhat, but your greatest honor is for your husband or wife. And I'm not saying you don't take care of your children. But listen, children are not meant to be there all the time under your care. They're to go out and make their own life one day. They're to get married, Lord willing, and, and have a family of their own one day. But I tell you, marriage is till death do us part. And so your main dedication has to be to your husband or wife. And that is the best thing that you can do for your child is to give them a stable marriage. There needs to be a dedication to the point that divorce is never brought up. I was counseling a family one time who, by the way, right now is divorced. And the lady told me, she said, I didn't even think about divorce until one time in an argument. He said, well, I'll just divorce you. And she said, well, okay, let's do it. Hey, don't ever even talk that way. Don't ever bring it up. If you don't believe in it, don't even use the D word. Don't ever even threaten that. 
Don't talk like that. Every couple must have a high priority on their marriage and in order to protect their children. First of all, you're going to have to talk to one another. And one time I remember asking my wife, what could I do to show her I loved her on a daily basis? She said, well, you could talk to me. And I thought we was talking. But I don't guess we was talking like when we was dating, you know. And there needs to be time where you take out time in the day where you look in each other's eyes and talk. Talk about what's important to you. Talk about your plans. Talk about the children. Talk about your relationship with God. Talk to one another. Amen. Well, glory be to God. Come on now, church. You've got to have a tenderness in your heart. You've got to keep that. You've got to plan on keeping that. If you ever get to the place where there's a little hardness, you need to study 1 Corinthians 13, pray through, and get tender towards one another again. Forgiveness must be, you've got to be generous with that. It cannot be. Pride, you know, pride wants to win the argument. But just humble on down, forgive one another, and go on past it. And don't keep a long list about stuff. The problem is that people get in little arguments about little things and then all of a sudden it spills over into this long list of stuff they hadn't taken care of. And it just starts with somebody being a little late and that's a little bitty small thing. But then it goes back for several years and all of a sudden you're in a heated argument about something. Take care of that stuff and forgive and forget that and get over it. And just deal with whatever problem there is right there and talk it out. And if you ever do get so heated that you can't talk anymore, say, well, let's, let's quit this for a little while. Let's pray and calm down and come back and talk about this later. All right? got to have daily prayer and I think it's good every day to thank God for your husband or wife because you know why what will happen is if the devil has his way he'll get you thinking about all their little things that didn't matter when you was dating you know little bitty things little bitty things that irritate you and it's kind of cute when you was dating you know because you know, or I'll change him. Hey, you're not going to change him. Just, you know, if God don't change him, just forget it. <laughs> Same way with her. You're not going to change her. If God don't change her, you know, it's just, it's, you just forget it. Just, you better get a list of things that you love about that person and thank God for them every day. Amen. Because you can start looking at the good things. I can see it's going to take longer than what I was planning. But here you're going, to have to, you're going to have to thank God for your husband or wife every day. Every day. And a gratitude for the things that a husband and wife does every day. You know, it's nice to thank her for cooking your meals or cleaning the house. Or it's nice to thank him for making a living. It's not to say I appreciate you being there for my children. I appreciate the way that you 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 pray with the family or whatever. You know, you just you just there's got to be something that you can show appreciation instead of just nagging one another all the time. Instead of just te- bringing out every time you see them, they come home from work. You bring out your list of things they done wrong for the day, or things they didn't get through with yesterday. You know, or he meets you with all of that. Hey, that's not really a good plan for a good relationship. You've got to, you've got to be grateful for the things they're doing right. Amen. And then there needs to be a mutual respect. You know, I think so, I think there's an attack on the idea 
that men need respect. Psychologists talk about male ego and feminists act like it's some stupid, ignorant Neanderthal thing. I realize that a man can get to the place where he's overbearing and foolish. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. But do you realize the Bible teaches that a man ought to learn how to love his wife? That the Bible also teaches that a woman needs to learn how to respect her husband and honor him. I don't care how many lovey-dovey, thoughtful things a woman does for her husband if she doesn't convey the idea of honor and respect. He ain't going to believe you when you say, I love you. You put him down in front of everybody, make him feel like he's nothing because he's not making a certain amount of money or whatever, you know. I'm going to tell you, there comes some little woman into his life that acts like that he's Superman one day. And he'll be tempted. And if he's a Christian and he's got a stable relationship with God, he'll overcome. But you put him in a place of temptation. Same way with you. Husband, if you don't honor her, lift her up, make her feel valuable, protected like your price, uh, priceless jewel. If you don't make her feel cherished and nourished, I'm, I'm going to tell you, there come a guy along that will tell her she's pretty. There come a guy that tell her that she looks nice. And if she's a Christian and got a real stable relationship with God, and she'll overcome, I tell you, put her in a place of temptation. Amen. you got to honor one another. There are problems. Realize that the preservation of marriage is more important than preserving a reputation. Now, what I mean by that is if you're having trouble, it'd be better to go talk to somebody and admit you're having trouble than to keep on having bitter fightings amongst you until you're split apart and then everybody knows it. So just, you know, just kind of swallow real hard and have to go admit, say, yeah, we're, we're not doing as good as I'd like. And get some help. In the Old Testament book of Malachi, God spoke through the prophet about the subject of divorce or putting away. Listen to what it says. God's displeased, said, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed. Unstable marriages hurt children. Raising up a godly seed, it, it's important for the church to have a standard against divorce and remarriage. Now, I can understand if sinners do it. Sinners are sinners. I'm, I'm not saying it's right by no mean. I understand sinners getting drunk and getting high and doing all that other stuff too, but I don't approve of it, not even in sinners' lives. I can understand a sinner doing it, but listen, Church people, if you're a Christian, it ain't in your universe. No. No, I don't approve of it in a sinner, but they're sinners. But who in the world would claim to be a Christian and do something like that? Amen? Say, well, I'll just backslide and do it. And pray through and God will forgive me and it'll be okay. I'd say to you just like I'd say to anybody planning on sinning and coming back and getting right with God. You may not. You may not. It doesn't matter if some young person thinking, well, I'll go out and try drugs. What if you get addicted to drugs? What if you get on bad drugs? What if drugs blow your mind and you don't even have the sense to know to pray through It's the same way. I don't care what sin you're talking about. 
Well, I'll go rob a bank, repent of it, you know, and God will let me keep the money. And, uh, I, you know, I'll pay tithes on it, Lord, if you'll let me get away with it. You know, I'll give to a missionary. Hey, listen, I know it, but people, it's really, I know that's funny, but it's really silly to plan on sinning. I, don't, I, I know I'm talking about divorce and remarriage, but I'm talking about ever sin. Do not ever think, well, I'll just go out and do this and come back. It won't hurt me. I mean, listen, you're going to cut your arm off and say, that did, that did no big deal. I mean, even if you do get back right with God, you cut your arm right off. You've lost a part of your life. You've done something that you'll regret. So, I hope you understand. We've got to have some high values on divorce and remarriage. I believe there's forgiveness for all sins except the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. But listen, if you go out thinking you're going to come back and repent of whatever sin it is, you can get bound by sin too. And not only that, God is not necessarily obligated to just Deal with you every time you blink your eyes say, well, Lord, I'm ready for you to deal with me now. He's not obligated to do that. So just to say, well, I'll go out, I'll party a while, and I'll come back and get right with God because Danny Thrasher, he, he, he went out and, you know, did all that, and he came back. Hey, listen, there's a lot of people go out of church, and they don't ever come back. They don't ever. And, and listen, we need to have faith while we're praying that God's going to move. But the fact is, you just don't do stuff like that. Amen. Proverbs 22 and 6 I, it says, um, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. We need to give our children training, don't we? There's a difference between training a child and raising a child. You know what it is? To raise a child, all you got to do is feed them, clothe them, keep them healthy, and they become adults. To train a child, you actually have to teach them how to act. Amen. There's a big difference. That's right. You can raise a garden, but you still got to take time to raise a garden. Some, some people don't realize that to train a child involves much more than just raising a child. You can feed a horse, and you can make sure that horse is, you know, taken care of. But eventually, if you're going to try to ride the horse, if you're going to try to get the horse to pull something, if you're going to get the horse to perform some type of task, that horse has to be trained. And a child that is going to actually do something, not only in life, has not only in his future life, but even right now, has to have some type of discipline, some type of training. When a child is small, there needs to be certain basic commands that is taught to a child, like no I mean, they may not understand why no just yet. But you can let them know what N-O means. Amen. And, and you can train them to stop. You can train them to come. They, well, what's the big deal about that? What if they're about to head out in front of a car? And if you hadn't trained them to stop and come, what if they're about to reach out and grab that pretty little rattlesnake? I tell you what, we got to train them no and stop and come really means something. If you got to get around them and play games, you know, I'm not claiming to be the perfect parent. Please. I'm just giving you an example of stuff I did when my boys was little. If I saw that they wasn't coming when I said come, I said, all right, we're going to play some games right now, boys. You know, I'd correct them if they was rebelling against me. But, and, uh, but I'd say, we're going to play some games. Get over there 
and do something, come. Stop. Come. Stop. You know? I'd get them doing stuff like that until eventually they'd start doing what I said. Amen. And so when a child is small, some of those little things need to be taught them, but there comes a time where you're transitioning over and they understand more and they have to be trained not only in the things that they should not do, but also in the things that they should. There Again, Jack Howells, I read a book by him, but Jack Howells said that his mother would always want him to associate the word no with cigarettes and alcohol and different things. So she'd get a magazine and, and tear out uh, 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 one of these cigarette uh, advertisements or, or liquor advertisements and said she'd set him down and she'd say, no, no, no. Now you say it. And he'd say, no. She'd say, say it stronger. No. And he'd say, no, no. And she'd tear it up and she'd throw it down. She'd stomp on it. He said, I never smoked a cigarette. Hallelujah. What do you, what do you not want your children to do? Jack Hiles also said, he said, my, my mom taught me manners. And, of course, you know, he's dead and gone. He's, he's from a, a different generation. But I'm not, there was a time, really, proper manners just respected womanhood in general. It really did. It honored womanhood. And we was a whole lot better off as a nation when we honored woman, womanhood in general. And uh, he said, he said, my mom would play a game with me. He said, now you're on the bus. We're going on the bus. The bus is stopped. And I'm a lady that's got on the bus and every seat is full. What do you do, Jack? He said, I stand up and I say, ma'am, would you take my seat? He, she'd play games with him. And, and, and he, he said that uh, even now, he said, he said, my mom so trained me to stand when a woman even entered the room. He said, I can't stay seated when a woman enters a room. Now, it used to be proper etiquette. And I was trained to open doors for women. I can't, I'll just tell you, if I have a knowledge that there's a woman behind me, I cannot go through that door. It just, I just can't do it. You say, boy, that's pitiful preaching. Where's that in the Bible? Well, the Bible teaches that love actually honors people, and love is polite. <laughs> Amen. And so I, anyway, well, maybe someday we'll get into a good message one of these days, but I am preaching to you how that we need to train our children. I've read Deuteronomy 6. It says, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now, you can't do that and watch TV. No, you can't do that at the movie theater. No. You can't do that at, you know, at the dance with the rock and roll and all that. No, you've got to have an atmosphere that's conducive to training your children. If you're supposed to be able to bring about the word of God day and night all the time, I'll tell you, you've got to clean up your house. Praise the name of Jesus. How to clean up your house. Oh, it's our job to teach our children. Here's a few Bible passages that need to be taught to children. How the children can be saved. That's, that's first and foremost. Teach them how to be saved. Teach them how the Lord died upon the cross and rose from the dead for their salvation. And if they confess their sins, the Lord will forgive them. Secondly, teach them how the child can live for God. Holiness of life, prayer, Bible reading, faithfulness to church needs to be taught in a child. Soul winning can be taught to a child. 
Teach them the Ten Commandments. Teach them the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Teach them principles from the Proverbs. I'm going through the book of Proverbs with my family right now. Amen. There's such things as moral purity and work and the sin of laziness and responsibility all in the book of Proverbs. Amen. Teach about the life of Christ, the book of Acts, Bible stories that teach courage and faith and conviction, Bible principles on finances. Teach your children. Talk to them about these things. If they don't learn it from you, who are they going to learn it from? Hey, well, that's what I go to the church for. Hey, listen, we can't teach them all the time like the Bible teaches. We've got a few hours with them. You've got, you've got many, many more hours with them than what we do. Hey, man, oh, yes, we need to get certain attitudes and character traits in our children. Personal responsibility needs to be in our children. Hey, man, we've got a generation that's arising that'll blame everybody else. Hey, man, that has an excuse for everything. Hey, man, as to why they can't do something, there needs to be a personal responsibility trained into a child. Hey, man, isn't it any wonder why some children get get grown and they say, well, I can't live for God and I've got this reason and that reason. I've got all these other things. Hey, listen. Don't give your children a reason to offer excuses all the time. An attitude of hope is priceless. A bright outlook about things. A whining, pouting, complaining child will be a whining, pouting, complaining adult one of these days. Amen. Generosity is good. Because it's more than just giving money. I'll tell you, generosity will help in the character traits in so many other ways. Uh, respect for authority. Respect for older people. Uh, hey man, I'll, I'll teach a child uh, not just to go off after everybody else, uh, but to understand the old paths are right. Uh, the old truth is right. Uh, hey man, yeah, go ahead. Teach them to be polite in their conversation uh, and conduct in public. Uh, Children need to be taught that God made them special. Listen, boys were made to be boys. And girls were made to be girls. Praise God. Hey man, I got a got an article. I'm going to preach a little holiness one of these days about, did you see that pitiful family that they were celebrating uh, allowing that Poor little boy to dress up like a girl. The boy princess even wrote a book about it. Hey, listen. Hey, man, that little boy needs to be taught. He was created by God to be a little man. Hallelujah. Hey, man. Yes, God made us special. God made young boys to be men. Hey, man, it's all right for them to want to be defenders and protectors. And Hey, man, it's all right for them to play with guns. Hey, man, and swords and like knives and do stuff like that. It's all right for them to lift weights and want to be tough because they're supposed to defend their homes. They're supposed to defend their families. They're supposed to defend their country if needed be glory to God amen same thing now I'm not for teaching a child to be violent that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about just teaching them a little boy ought to have a little adventuresome heroic desire and it's all right because that's the way God made them amen you think of all the men in the Bible that is valiant and manly There ain't no such book as great sissies of the Bible. Amen. Because there ain't no great sissies anywhere. Period. Girls need to be, you know, to celebrate their feminine feminine side. Amen. Oh, I tell you, it's it's sad, and I and I've seen parents, you know, they so wanted a boy or they so wanted a girl, and they communicated that all the time. And so, the little girl, what she want to be? She don't want to be a girl. You better be careful about that. You better repent of that and say, "Thank God, He gave me a girl. Thank God, He gave me a boy." And you raise that boy to be a boy, and that girl to be a girl. Children need to 
be taught that God made them special. Amen. We need to teach our children truthfulness because a child that'll lie and you say, oh, that's a cute little thing. They won't keep a commitment. They won't even be able to tell God they're really sorry and mean it one day. Got to be truthful. Amen. One other thing, you got to give your children yourself. You. I know in our society we make excuses. Uh, I tell you, it's okay. It's okay as long as you're working. It's okay as long as you're working if you neglect your family, if you neglect God. It's okay because we've made work and making money into a God. We worship our work. We worship our work. We work at our play and we play at our worship. <laughs> That's not the order of things. Worship has to be worship. God has to be first. And yes, we need to work. And I appreciate every man that'll make a living for his family because the Bible says if you don't, you're worse than an infidel and you denied the faith. No matter how much you know the Bible or whatever, you, you, you've denied the faith. You're a bad example. And so, I, you know, there's both ditches. But the truth is there are some parents so busy making a living that they don't have a life. Their children don't have a life. Their children don't even know what to believe. Their children don't even have a clue about how wonderful God is. They, they don't even have a clue about how great Dad is. And I've gotten in, in that one time. I remember when Luke was really small. One day I stopped what I was doing and went in there where they was playing and sat down with them. And he said, Dad, what's wrong? I said, nothing. I just want to be in here with you. He said, you mean you just came in here and we didn't ask you or beg you or nothing? You know, you can get too busy. You get too busy and your family needs you. That's one more reason not to have television or, you know, a bunch of these other things that suck your time away, drain you. Hey, Amen. Boundaries. Proverbs 3 and 12 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. You know, children feel rejected when they're not corrected. They do. They don't feel loved. I wish I had this. I, I read I didn't read it in Ann Landers. I was reading a book about raising children, and this fella uh, quoted this. But there was a, there was a, a letter from two, teen, uh, from two teenagers that was written to Ann Ladder, Landers. One of them said, I have the worst mom in the world. Said she makes me come home at night. She checks on me. When I'm away, if I go to somebody's house, she'll call over there to make sure I'm there. She, she has all these rules and restrictions. I'd, I wish I was like other kids that just got to do whatever I wanted to do, stay out and party and all of this other stuff. Another teenage girl read that and wrote in, and you could hear the wounds in her heart. She said, I wish I had a mom like that, Mom. She said, I can go out. My mom never checks on me. I could spend the night anywhere, and she'd never ask where you've been. She doesn't even care. She said, you might think you have the worst mom in the world, but I think you have a loving mom because I don't feel loved even though I get to do whatever I want to do. Yeah. I tell you, if you're a child, if you're a teenager, and your mom and dad has some boundaries, praise God for that mom and dad. If they correct you when you rebel, praise God for that mom and dad. Amen. Uh, it says, he that spareth his rod, spareth the rod, his rod, hateth his son. doesn't say he spoils them. It says he hates them. <laughs> Amen. It's a lot harder. Now, I'm going to say this. 
I've seen some people, the only time that they can correct their children is if they're mad. Now, if they don't love them enough to stop having fun and doing whatever they're doing to correct their children, uh, you know, it'll come across wrong because you'll be imbalanced. One day you'll be hard, next day you'll be lenient, and they won't ever know what the rules are. You have to be consistent about things. That's the first thing. But the second thing, you also have to do it in a spirit of love. What are you trying to do when you correct your children? Are you just trying to make them hurt? No. You're trying to bring them to repentance. You're trying to get them where they will not do this anymore. Now, I don't believe in spanking your child for everything, but I do believe if there's rebellion there, if they have went against, you know, sometimes kids are just kids. But if they have stepped across the line and there's a boundary, if there's a rebellion, if they are doing something that's against authority, then they need to have that corrected. That is, that needs to be chastisement. And they need to have it explained to them if they're old enough to understand at least. I mean, there, there comes time when a little baby, you got, no, no, and I understand that. But, <laughs> and see there, see there, she's feeling the love in this message. But at any rate, there comes time where they understand. You have to let them know. You know, it's not right for a child to get whipped for something they don't know they've done wrong. Or they don't understand. I mean, they understand you're mad. They're, but they don't understand what, what's going on here. It just jerked them up and maybe because you're embarrassed because it's in front of somebody else or something. You know, I, don't, I don't know. But take them aside, talk to them, tell them what they've done wrong, correct them, pray with them, and hug them and let them know you love them. But when you correct them, the, the whole goal is to Bring them to repentance. And when God corrects us, that's what he's trying to do. He's not trying to drive us away from him. He's trying to break our will so we will come to him. And in the end, if a child refuses to hug you, you hadn't broke their will just yet. They have not become repentant. And I'll tell you, when you do break that will, if you're consistent enough and you do break that will, that child is going to come close to you. There's going to be a tenderness to you. Just like me, when God whips me and I turn to him, there's a closeness between me and God. There'll be a closeness between mom and dad and the children. Glory to God. I also believe that there, there's one, there, I, let's see, two more things here that I've got and I hadn't I know I, I think y'all think that I've read this whole thing but I haven't there's more to it I may need to put this in a book eventually one day uh, the next thing is you need to give your family devotions children family devotions they need to Joshua said as for me and my house we will serve the Lord you need to train your children in the ways of God. Talk to them about the word of God. Speak to them and have prayer together. You say, well, Brother Lloyd, I'm just not sure if I'm qualified to do that. Uh, God qualifies you. Hey, man, if, if all you can do is take a section of scripture and read it to your children and make a few comments and then ask them and say, listen, I want to ask you, can you think of a Bible figure that really uh, showed this? If you read a scripture about purity, uh, I want to ask you boys, can you, can you tell me about somebody in the Bible that, that showed moral purity? Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, that's right. Get them involved. And you think of somebody that failed morally and paid for it dearly. David. Yes, David did. And tell the story of David just a little bit. But emphasize it. Uh, and you, can you tell me somebody that acted bravely for the Lord? Uh, oh, hey man, what about Peter when he stood up on the day of Pentecost? And you think of somebody that was cowardly. Well, what about Peter when he was at the fire there? 
Amen. All of these things need to be communicated and you need to have prayer. They need to hear you praying, mom and dad. They need to have a spiritual atmosphere. Amen. I I think one of the greatest compliments a dad had one time is he overheard his children talking, amen, with some kids down the street. Amen. And, And the one fellow was saying, one little boy was saying, you know, my dad knows the governor. My dad knows the judge. My dad knows this. Uh, hey Amen. And, and, and the one boy said, well, you know, my dad knows God. Well, how do you know he knows God? He talks to him every morning. Uh, he prays. Uh, I hear him pray. Uh, glory be to God. You've got to communicate some spirituality in your home. Uh, homes need to be a revival place. Uh, homes need to be a place where children can feel the presence uh, of the living God. Hallelujah. You need to give them, finally, memories. I think family traditions are wonderful. Holidays are wonderful. Do things that are special. I I never have done this, but I thought one family that I knew really had a great tradition. Through the year, they had a box that they put answers to prayer. They'd write them down, put the answers. And on Thanksgiving Day, after they ate, they'd pull out answer to prayer that they'd had through the year and read them and thank God. I, I think as a great family tradition and a way to teach children as well. Christmas, I think all of these things can be wonderful times with family. Vacations can be, you know, I remember going on a vacation to Florida with my grandma and papa and my uncle and my mom and my brother. And there's so many people that want to do so many things. Most of the time I think we shopped. And you know, a teenage boy in Florida really don't want to shop. And so I probably pouted and, you know, did a bunch of stuff I shouldn't have done. But, you know, the memory of that, really. Here, I'm 47 years old. That's when I was 16 years old. I got my driver's license and drove all the way to Florida. With my mom let me drive through Atlanta. I'm telling you, that was a memory. But, and she probably still has nightmares from it. But, you know, I'm 47 years old. And my grandma and papa's gone. But, you know, I still have a real touching, fond memory about that vacation, even though I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. And that was good for me, really. You got to do memories. I want to ask you, what are your children going to remember about you? What type of memories are they going to have? Throwing stuff? Or times when the Holy Ghost fell in the home? Time when the Spirit of God moved. Well, really, I don't know. I hope y'all got something out of this. That even though I preach to parents, this applies to grandparents too. You know, I have some, you know, I got saved. And I really went through a battle. I, I, I felt like I committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, and I didn't. There's a preacher came by and preached on the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you what, if you could, you could do anything and blaspheme the Holy Ghost, according to that preacher. And I just got so tormented about it. My mom was a nurse. She worked at the hospital at nights and my dad was dead so I spent the night a lot of times with my grandma and papa and I'd go in and I was tormented and I'd say grandma would you come pray with me and I still remember my grandma praying with me Whew, boy you gotta have some memories you gotta have some memories of how how you acted at church of, of how you prayed in the home of the 
togetherness of stuff. And you may not think you're making a big impression, but here's a 47-year-old man still getting choked up about his grandma praying with him at night. Oh, glory to God. I want you to know the family is so valuable. Amen. Could we all stand here this morning? Heavenly Father, I know we, we have a baby dedication, and I, I guess really maybe I said more than I I don't know, Lord. It's all, I just give this all to you, and I pray if someone's lost here today that they'd make up in their mind, they're going, as for me and my house, and it's going to start with me, I'm going to serve the Lord. And Lord, I pray too. That for every family here, every mom and dad, every grandma, papa, everybody that has influence in their home, I'm asking for the Holy Ghost to help us and raise up a generation that can have revival in our homes. Oh, God, they're so under attack of the devil. There's so much of the enemy coming against us. These poor little children, abuse is so high. Oh, God, there's so many things that's, that's just ripping our homes apart. I plead the blood against it. I'm praying for the Holy Ghost to work in this altar service and that you give us revival in our homes. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. i like for as many families as would to just come up here. Let's pray together. I feel the Holy Ghost trying to do something in our homes. I've said it before. I've said it so many times. I believe the greatest revival that Fairland will ever have will start in our homes. When the Holy Ghost is moving in such a powerful way, Oh, yes, come. Everybody that would. Hey, if you don't have a family, I want you to come too. Because you want, you, want, you want to raise your children, grandchildren. You need wisdom. We need wisdom and anointing to be able. We need the wisdom of God and the anointing of God. To be able to raise our families in the ways of the Lord. God loves your house. God wants your house in the ark. God wants your family to partake of the Passover lamb. God wants your home to be a place of peace. Oh, let's all come up here. Let's join together. And we're going to pray for Curtis and Cherie and their family here just a little bit. But let's all, let's all as a family join together. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I pray you bless these homes. Move in these families. Send revival to the home, Lord. Send a tenderness. Turn the hearts of husbands and wives to each other. Turn the hearts of parents and children to each other. Let there be a tenderness, Lord. Brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and cousins, Lord. Let there be a tenderness, Lord, here today. Oh, I plead the blood against the enemy. I plead the blood against the devil and try to come in to our homes, oh God. Let our homes be a place of revival, of prayer, of the word of God. Oh God, move by your grace and power. Give us a conviction against divorce and remarriage. Give us a conviction, Lord. Oh Lord, against being bitter. Lord, let there be forgiveness in people's hearts. Let there be tenderness in people's souls. Oh, God, work your work. 
Oh, glorify your name. Make us close to each other. Oh, God, bless our families. <laughs> bless our homes, Lord. Put up a hedge, Lord. Put up a hedge, oh, Lord. Put up a hedge, dear God. Put up a hedge. Oh God, change our lives. Change our hearts, Lord God. Lord, raise up a standard. Raise up a standard, Lord. Let the biblical family come. Let the biblical family come alive in this church. Bless your people. Lord, now I pray too for families that have lost companions, that have lost children. Lord, I... I claim the promises that you want them saved. I'm praying that you would save our lost children, save lost grandchildren, save lost husbands and wives. Oh, God, you want our house to be saved. 